Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to introduce my uh, today's special guest, uh, Miss uh, Amy Jain, uh, who is a prominent uh, lawyer, legal expert uh, from India. Good afternoon, Miss Jain, and thank you very much for joining us today. Good afternoon. It's a great privilege for me to be here today. Uh, Ms. Jane, I will be very grateful if you can uh, share with uh, our audience uh, your uh, background, how you came to legal sphere, what you're actually doing in law, uh, what type of clients uh, you work with, uh, why you actually chose law. So just uh, please give brief uh, insight uh, on this question. Yeah, so uh, I'm a lawyer, I'm a corporate lawyer. Uh, I am currently working with an MNC, uh, which is based in Noida. So um, I particularly, you know, uh, pertain to US clients. So, you know, um, as a lawyer, I have spent many years studying laws, governing contracts and helping the clients understand, you know, how these uh, fundamentals can be applied to their daily lives. So, uh, yeah, I believe that, you know, contracts are foundation for any transactions, whether, you know, it's between two individuals or across multiple countries, because, you know, they guide us about how we do business, uh, protect our rights, you know, obligations and interests, and also provide, provide us the framework for resolving disputes. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to sharing some insight on this topic for without viewers today. Um, Ms. Jane, uh, if we are talking about gen Generally, legal sphere, there are many lawyers nowadays, many lawyers, and uh, uh, physical and legal entities have to uh, deal, uh, have to choose between many lawyers, because actually there is now overproduction of lawyers, that's a bit straight, uh, in the whole world, because it's a very uh, uh, lucrative industry, and that's why university, the universities, they offer law degrees, BA, MA degrees. So, uh, what is your recommendation? How? to choose lawyer. Let's say the person stick with the problem. Uh, he is running his legal entity, he is dealing with the trademark law, etc., IP law. How to choose the lawyer? Because all lawyers, they say that they are highly competent and they can solve your matter. How to choose the best one? So, um, you know, uh, just see uh, what uh, what are the specifications and what are the, uh, you know, area of expertise your, your problem requires. And then I'll suggest accordingly choose the lawyer who is expert in that, uh, in that field. So that is the... Yeah. You are very serious uh, in dealing with uh, service agreements. Service agreements are hugely important issue, especially if you're talking about modern economy, which based on service, especially in digital era when many services are conducted remotely. So what is the service uh, agreement uh, in terms of international private law? How can you evaluate it? Okay, so um, a service agreement, which is, you know, also known as a service level agreement, it is a formal document which outlines the services that a provider will deliver to the other party. So it basically governs the terms and condition of the service that one party provides the another. Now, you know, uh, if you ask me uh, why this agreement is important for the parties, so you know, it is important for the parties because it helps them to protect their mutual interests and uh, sets out the obligations and expectations of each party. So, you know, it covers um, clauses governing delivery, use, payment, and other aspects of service. And, uh, you know, usually include the inf information such as the scope of work, pricing, payment, schedules, you know, responsibility of both the parties. So, and, you know, also govern the dispute resolution process. So it's it gives clarity to the parties about the legal framework, which can help them to resolve their disputes or issues that may arise in relation to services that are provided. Uh, one of the most important issue for a company uh, is to secure that uh, there won't be any leaks from what uh, actually company is doing. This is crucially important nowadays. Uh, and that's why I would like to ask you regarding the non-disclosure clause as a part of the service agreement and this role. Um, why this non-disclosure uh, clause matters? 
and how it has to be formulated in order to be then enacted uh, uh, by the book and uh, defended in the court. Okay, so um, a non-disclosure clause or a confidentiality clause, um, is that clause in which, you know, one or both the parties to the contract agrees to maintain the secrecy of information which is being shared between them. So uh, the interpretation of this clause can, you know, vary from agreement to agreement. But, you know, typically it means that the confidential information such as the uh, trade secrets, intellectual property, or, you know, any other sensitive information uh, must not be disclosed to the third parties. So, you know, this is um, important in business relations where, you know, one party uh, relies on the other party for their business operation. Now, I'll, I'll you know, uh, give you an example. Um, you know, suppose there is a software company who mm -hmm. enters into an agreement with an uh, outsourcing firm. Now, these two parties could include uh, a clause in their service agreement stating that, you know, uh, neither party will divulge information regarding each other's pricing structures, products, you know, uh, marketing strategies, customer list to the third parties. So, you know, this would ensure that both the companies and their potential sensitive customer data uh, remain secure and private during their relationship. Therefore, the confidentiality clauses are, you know, essential for many types of service agreement because they help the parties to maintain the security and important business information. Okay, now we just uh, talked about the situation when we are dealing with a software company, when we are dealing with um, the well-established business, let's say, or startup business. But uh, now, uh, because there are many platforms, and now actually, um, there are many companies which offer you uh, services by not creating your own company, but you but they act as your intermediary. So you don't have, let's say, legal entity, but you conduct service through their company and find clients. So basically you work through that particular company. At the same time, you also can uh, call freelancers to the table. You can hire freelancers, etc. So what to do, for instance, if you work, let's say, with freelancers, partially legal. Let's speak truthfully. There are many cases when there is no agreement and the, uh, the freelancers are paid uh, just uh, maybe on their private accounts, et cetera. So let's start with talking in reality. So how then the person uh, can secure that there will be no leak in case they don't have a written agreement? Is it possible to apply an oral consecutive agreement uh, then in law and in court? See, uh, in law, in contract law, there are two types of agreement, oral agreement and written yes. agreement. In uh, most of the laws, both the agreements are, you know, valid. But if you go, if any dispute occurs, where do we go? We go before the court. So in, if there is an oral agreement, it is, you know, a bit hard to prove, uh, prove in court that there, there was an agreement between the two parties. But if this agreement isn't written, so, you, you know, you have that document in place to show the court that, yes, two parties have agreed into an agreement and, you know, these are the rights and obligations which are outlined there. So, uh, you know, if you ask me as a lawyer, I'll always suggest you that go for the written agreement. Which law uh, govern transborder service agreement? So let's, for instance, uh, uh, there is an agreement between one party is from European Union, another party from India or from Ukraine, etc. Or there is a tribal agreement. So which law uh, governs uh, this situation? Yeah. So, um, you know, the governing of trans-border, we are talking about service agreements. So the governing of trans-border service agreement, uh, you know, it will depend on the jurisdiction uh, or the governing law that is involved in the agreement. So, you know, as these laws can differ from country to country, so um, generally uh, contracts are governed by the laws of the place in which, you know, they were created or in which the services are being provided. 
so you know in the dispute uh, you know in the event of the dispute courts in that jurisdiction will refer to the jurisdictions laws and precedent while they interpret the ruling on a dispute based on that contracts so you know it is um, you know important for anyone drafting and entering into a contract involving the international parties to uh, consult an attorney who is familiar with the book, both local laws you know governing the contracts as well as you know any relevant international treaties or regulation which may apply are there any peculiarities uh, uh, in service agreements or when uh, they deal with the uh, intellectual property law um yes intellectual property uh, law is very important uh, if you talk about the service agreement so um basically you know what is intellectual property intellectual property uh, you know refers to creations of mind uh, such as you know inventions uh, literary and artistic works uh, symbols images etc so you know these uh, these uh, intellectual properties are protected by law from uh, unauthorized use by others you know by the means of uh, you know giving copyrights patents trademark trade secrets etc so um, you know um, talking about the intellectual property clause in service agreement so ip clause in a service agreement outlines the set of the terms and condition that sets out how the parties to the agreement will handle each other's intellectual property rights so uh, these provision broadly defines uh, you know what will be considered as an intellectual property at the definition you have to define under your contract that what is an intellectual property then you know who owns or who can use the intellectual property that either party has created and outlines you know what type of license or you know other rights will be used to protect the ip breach so um you know to give you more clarity about this concept uh, i'll bifurcate this so if you ask me you know uh, i am a service provider and i'm already i'm already holding some ip on my name and i'm bringing this ip to provide you some services okay so by which there will be generation of some new ip so in this situation uh, who will have the ownership of ip so this concept uh, is bifurcated into background ip and arising ip so background ip refers to the intellectual property that is owned by one parties to the contract prior to the agreement and take prior to the agreement taking effect and while arising ip refers to the intellectual property that is created during the performance of the agreement mm -hmm. um so i'll give you an example um if a software development company is entering into a contract with a client to design new software okay then any existing ip that the software development company owns would be considered as a background ip and the client would typically own the arising ip which consists of the new software as the part of the contract so this is not the case every time you have to negotiate so sometimes you know parties agree for a joint ip mm -hmm. or uh, there can be a situa situation where the service provider keep the ownership of the ip and provides the other party only the license to use that intellectual mm -hmm. property so uh, all of it depends on how these parties negotiate their rights and liabilities and then let's uh, go through the checklist uh, of service agreements so let's say there are both parties uh, one party drafted this agreement another party reviewed this agreement they are going to sign this agreement so let's go through the checklist so what definitely have to be included in service agreement uh, so for this service agreement to be enforced okay so uh, you know there are two types of clauses in any any service mm -hmm. agreement uh, the operative clauses which are very uh, important to that service agreement and with uh, other ones are of the boilerplate clauses which are basic in the agreement so now we are talking about the services so you know the first clause which you have to keep in mind is the description of the services which should be you know outlining the scope type frequency and duration of the services which is to be provided you know including any terms uh, additional terms or requirements so the first you have to keep in mind the description of the services okay secondly um, as for me the important one is the payment clause so um, you know outlining when how and how much payment will be made to the service provider uh, provider and including the mode of the payment 
so um, you know the payment clause is the other important clause then the termination clause uh, outlining the you know process of termination liability is applicable upon the termination and applicable to uh, you know uh, if there is any retainage from uh, any party so um, the retainage clauses so all these will be termed under the uh, termination agreement then you know um, warranties and disclaimer clauses you know detailing the uh, guarantees offered by one party service provider to the other party as the part of this agreement and you know uh, disclaiming any liabilities for damages resulting from the activities relating to the services performed under this agreement then um, um, you might know the indemnification clause so you know um, indemnification clause uh, outlining you know one or both the parties responsibility for losses or damages in, uh, incurred by the other party as a result of their actions or negligence or as a result of any other damage which is you know caused by their own actions then um, you can include the um, dispute resolution process mm -hmm. Um, you know, which outlines how the uh, disputes and legal proceedings resulting from this agreement will be managed. So, um, not always the uh, you know court cases are recommended. Uh, recommended, you know, you can use the alternative dispute resolution process like you know arbitration, mediation, conciliation, litigation. So uh, you know all all these things you know should be outlined in the contract to make it a watertight agreement then um uh, uh, we you know talk up, we are talking about the contracts between the two individuals from different countries so in international contracts uh, governing law or the choice of uh, choice of law plays a very important role specifying the you know jurisdiction uh, jurisdiction from which the law of that contract will be governed uh, so for instance uh... Uh, am I correct that, uh, let's say, uh, you're from India, I'm from right. Ukraine. If we conclude an agreement, then, for instance, we can choose a governing law, uh, UK law or UST law or specific state in UC law, let's say Delaware law or some other type of laws. Yes. So it doesn't really matter that uh, we choose exactly either uh, law of India or law of Ukraine. We can choose law of the third party uh no it is uh, not always uh, like it's not um uh, uh, you know uh, i will say that um two parties when you are uh, you and me are entering into contract you're from ukraine i'm from india so basically what parties uh, do is that they enter into they uh, put the governing law of either india or ukraine but it is not a mandate, you know, you can choose any law, which mm -hmm. is convenient for both the parties. Generally, um, you know, I will um, tell you what happens in the market. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if you and I and are entering into a contract, one party will have the domin dominant position over the other. So uh, the practice is that the that party chooses the law of his particular country. But if we are on the similar position, mm -hmm. we can choose uh, any law which is from any third country. So that is not a mandate. Okay, but uh, let's say, uh, look uh, on the strategic point. For instance, uh, um, we uh, decide to conclude the contract. You are from India, I'm from Ukraine, let's say. Uh, if we decide to, let's say, to strengthen our position, yeah, so either we, for instance, can choose the governing law, UK law, for instance, or uh, maybe, let's say, you decide to register a company or to incorporate yourself, let's say, uh, in uh, Estonia or, uh, let's say, in UK. So uh, I will put in another way. Uh, is it really necessary to register your company under those uh, under that jurisdiction which you want to apply in case you have a court litigation or uh, or you don't need this jurisdiction you can simply come to court if this is in your contract so you don't need to incorporate in that country okay so uh, registering the company in a particular jurisdiction and you know mentioning the governing law in the contract are two different things mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. can you know um many businesses because you know delaware uh, you know you have talked about the registration of a company in delaware 
so dev, uh, mostly businesses or startup prefer deliver because it is a ideal uh, you know location to start a business because of the uh, you know ease in the process but you know um, since we are from uh, i am providing you cer certain services and we belong to different countries so it is not uh, you know a mandate that we have to uh, go before the deliver court to solve or resolve our disputes we can we can choose the uh, you know alternative dispute resolution process and we can uh, you know select any other procedure from any other law which we have selected in our contract so yeah and um, last question which i would like to ask you uh this dealing with uh, i think what is more important nowadays for the lawyer is how to uh let's say uh, present yourself how you how to sell a service and uh, uh, just one simple question how to define the price of your service because uh, uh service agreement is something as i understand which is uh let's say, uh, which has to be done from scratch and then to give it to a customer, customer pays, that's all. Or you can include some kind of, um, let's say, um, a day-to-day -day operation, a day-to-day -day support of the service agreement. So how you can, uh, let's say, uh, sell this type of service, uh, how uh, you have to define the fair price of your, uh, let's say, service to conclude service agreements. So just give a hint to lawyers how to build this from marketing point of view. They want to uh, be uh, successful in the market. So uh, you're asking me how lawyers, uh, you know, should determine the charges for their services. Am I right? Well, I'm asking you how services, yes, they uh, need to behave in order to, let's say, secure the confidence from their clients and uh, also to uh, have, a, uh, let's say, a remuneration for the service. Okay, I don't think that uh, this is the fair question to ask a lawyer, but I'll answer this. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, so um, before determining the uh, charges which you are going to you know um, ask from your client uh, you should you know keep in mind as a lawyer that uh, what are the um, inputs am i going to uh, give the client under this contract uh, you know what are the uh, number of hours i'll be you know putting into uh, this uh, relation between client and a lawyer so you know and the uh, area of expertise which i am going to provide him and um, you know whether i have to provide the other services like drafting a contract you know providing him the legal opinion then any other services which the clients are requesting from me so divide the cost uh, uh, to each service and then you know you can uh, put the quotation and uh, you know, also see the position of the client, whether the client is, you know, willing to give that much amount to you, whether uh, your opinion is providing that much value to his business to grow. So, you know, all these factors should be kept in mind. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Jane, for joining us today. I appreciate it because you are a very interesting speaker. You are a very professional lawyer. And I hope that in the future, you also will find time to comment some important changes in legal sphere and uh, in particular in service agreements. And I'm sure that will Thanks. be the case because uh, now uh, world economy is expanding and definitely the service uh, part of the economy will play a big role. So thank you Absolutely. very much, dear audience. Thank you very much, dear audience, for being us today. And today we hosted Amy Jane, one of the prominent uh, legal experts uh, and lawyers from India. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me.